Get ready. We're going to talk to Gary uh, Wayne uh, about a little bit of Halloween stuff. So here we go. Crazier out there. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Paranormal Into the Night on the Late Late Horror Show. What is going on? Uh, good to see everybody. Everybody is lined up ready for uh, Gary Wayne, uh, author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. And that the link to that book is right below in the description. Um, I would say go ahead and get that. It's, it's uh, a very, very long and interesting and detailed read um so, so definitely do that check out all the links description uh page down there and uh hello to everybody in the chat derby girl is here wow uh ginger is here connie clary is here edward stewart what's going on uh, dennis rtn uh black roses roger stevens mac um tracy asteria i'm going up the list hey 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 it's dave Pluffet, rich cat ranch what's going on um this is going to be a fun show. We are going to start off talking about Halloween. Well, you know what? L let me take that back. Uh, a fun show. Yes, we're going to try to make it as fun as possible. Uh, but again, a little discretion is always advised because anything that deals with religion um, can stir up things, you know? So pe people get either offended or or they believe one way. So we're going to try to be as fun as possible and talk about Halloween, talk about the fairies, the gnomes, all that good stuff, mythical creatures. But let's see where this takes us. So uh, I'm going to bring him right in. Uh, hello, Tokar. What's going on? Good to see you in the chat. I do have, you know, real quick. Uh, do I have it here? Oh, shoot. Tokar, I'm so sorry. I got that vest somewhere. Um, made me a vest uh, of a bunch of hor old horror comics. And it looks really, really cool. But anyways, next time I will get it to be shown here but hello uh, i'm gonna bring in gary wayne hey gary what's going on hey uh, thank you for inviting me uh, back to your show and so happy to be here and uh yeah kind of jazzed about uh, the time of year and the topic we're going to talk about oh yeah yeah it's it's halloween season <laughs> <laughs> what, what that means to you is probably a little bit different than what it means for most of us and and that's why i'd like to dive into it a little bit but um yes everybody's happy to have you back here uh it, it was very interesting uh to have you last time and people a lot of a lot of the people uh, were new to you um so they were just like wow okay this is some very interesting stuff um but we are since halloween is coming up we are going to take it in a little different direction and start off talking about halloween right um and again how's the book doing gary the book's doing good still six years later yeah it's crazy so uh, you know i had my best six months in sales uh, on my last royalty checks so yeah wow. who would have thought so it, it's uh, it's been very consistent it doesn't have a lot of highs and lows but it's it's very 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 consistent so and actually you know i think i, I would say overall the last two years that you know it's been kind of on on a steady sort of incline so very very happy with how it's having endurance out there and yeah you know what i hear a lot from people is is they keep it as a reference book and so when they're wanting to look something up they're going to go mm -hmm. up you know look it up because it's, it's laid out that you should be able to find you know a lot of the information that you're looking for for fairly quickly so and uh, i have a sequel that's going to be coming out um, nice finally right <laughs> well I, yeah and i said i would never write a sequel because i didn't want to be redundant and i thought it would be just sort of too much and the first book was designed to hit sort of all different groups just not christians even though it has a christian biases to it the mm -hmm. second book is uh more designed for christians but even anybody who's interested in giants fallen angels and demons and prophecy mm -hmm. it, you know it goes deep it gives you sort of all the detail that's in probably the most supernatural book that's ever been written the bible and 
brings wow. it into focus and all stuff that the churches and uh, ministers do not teach. Uh, right. And, and again, that's where the discretion comes in because, uh, you know, people's thoughts and views on, on religion are all different. But yes, I, I agree with you. But the first book, listen, it's it's a big, thick read. And yes, to put it in the office next to the dictionary and thesaurus and <laughs> encyclopedia, I can see that, you know, but um, lots of stuff in there. But over the six years, you've said, wait a second, there's even more to all of this. And, and I can go deeper on certain subjects and topics, right? Exactly. And I was also able to hear from people, they're trying to connect sort of more more of the dots on things, even though I connect a lot of dots, but sort of internal aspects of it, like what is the hierarchical uh, structure of both the angels in, in the Bible and the fallen angels or the gods of the pantheon and how do they sort of link up pick it up together, you know, sort of things like that. So I go deep into that sort of aspect of it, but I'm also relating it to why it's important to understand end time prophecy. So if you're an end time prophecy buff, you're going to get a lot of really good stuff that isn't normally linked into end time prophecy. In the new book, right? New book. Yeah. I do okay. a end time prophecy in the first book, but mostly I'm dealing with, you know, all the different narratives that come from all the different religious groups cultural groups things like secret societies all around the world so nice okay so uh yeah look forward to that geez um when that comes well listen down the road i'm sure i'll have you back again uh, when the new book comes out but let's let's get to and i did want to touch i got that in my notes the 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 groups uh the hierarchy of the angels uh i i if we got time here sometime uh, during this stream, I'd like to touch on that. But how does Halloween connect with the Bible? We all know the holiday uh, came uh, much later uh, that we know. Um, but how does it connect with um, the Bible and, and, and Halloween? How do they connect? Uh, yeah, so, the, the, yeah, the first thing is, is that um there's not a direct connection to halloween written mm -hmm. in the bible in other words it doesn't talk about that as a holiday a festival worship day anything like that uh but what it does do is it talks about beings that are involved on halloween so we have a lot of interesting things that people dress up um as in halloween so you have like a ghost which is um you you can get the ghost out of the bible and they definitely connect into the nephilim as let's say the the spirits of the disembodied giants and there's a uh, nephilim that's before the flood and there's and there's raphaim that's after the flood and raphaim has three words that's there's a few bit more but the most important words are there's three different versions of rafa 74 95 96 and 97 so the first one is as in healing as in a doctor as the giants would have had some self-healing the third one 97 is the actual tribe of giants but 96 is the definition of the demon spirit a evil spirit a shade words like that as it comes out of hebrew uh, you have vampires that are associated with 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 the nephilim you have goblins that are uh, and all sorts of fairy creatures that are part of the organizational structure both before and then again after the flood in terms of the hierarchy on earth as opposed to the invisible hierarchy and they're they're interconnected so fairies you have superheroes that people like to dress up on and they're all based on ancient nephilim and, and raphaim you have witches which is an important sort of part witches and, and warlocks they are like the priests and the priestesses of polytheist religions you have clowns with these white faces and these creepy faces uh, other things that are going on that are very much akin to the jokers of the european um vintage of similar types of positions in polytheist religions as as um, a let's call it a shaman type of uh, position and shamans are very much connected with halloween and of course we have that white face aspect that's also connected uh to uh 
you know the 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 day of the dead the uh, uh i'm trying to think of what it is a uh, day uh de los muertos if i've got it correctly hopefully okay. i didn't butcher it too badly with the spanish <laughs> audience that might be out there um and you've got like monsters like frankenstein and all sorts of kinds of monsters they're also connected into that whole nephilim sort of culture and you have werewolves which are a like a as, as a, you're seeing in a lot of the myth, mythos out there today like a parallel strain of a nephilim type of character which is is probably true you have zombies which is which are the undead which is like the um again the bodiless spirits of 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 of, of name uh, of uh of giants and you also have pirates that are connected in through that people like to dress up in that's connected through the knights templar um as part of being their fleet and they became the ones who popularized the skull and crossbones that symbolizes bones being put into an ossuary that sort of goes into their sort of mythos so you have a lot of costumes that are made up that go right back to it and you get a lot of science fiction costumes as well but they tend to all have that polytheist occult kind of connections to their sort of history so i i just sort of wanted to lay down sort of a platform there that there's a celebration here where uh all of the costumes are part of that culture or that history yeah. or that importance and all hallows eve is more than just halloween it is an ancient ancient celebration and it begins and it's also known as sam han um it, that it was actually as it is more clearly identified i think in greek mythology as being all, about two weeks in length so it begins okay. on october 31 and it goes all the way through for another 14 days which includes uh, november 11th which is another classic day of of uh, honoring the dead and it's a period when the demons and the spirits and associated types of beings that are in the underworld or hades or sheol or the other world or anwin or all the different kinds of names uh would start to come out through a, basically a portal or a fairy domain or something like that and into in and into this world so this is if it's not the most important polytheist celebration in terms of the ancient demigods mm -hmm. um then it is you know in the top couple for sure you might include something as in a spring festival or or the uh, and there's a few it could be the may day ones or it could be the ones about ashtoreth and uh, the fertility eggs and the coming of spring but they're usually sort of part of a long it's kind of a, like a longer celebration of the spring festival so i think it's probably one of the more important ones because of the connections to their history and their religion that is just on full display in halloween Oh yeah, yeah. No, um, were there festivals in the Bible that were mentioned that kind of uh, resembled what eventually became Halloween? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. No. Not anything that I could sort of directly sort of associate okay. it with. So the Bible doesn't tend to describe those kinds of things. They only okay. give you as much information. <laughs> as, right. Uh, yeah. and, and I guess I think the intent is not to lead people in that sort of direction. They're trying to keep them from going in that direction. So they don't want to give them too much. So gotcha. that's why you really have to be able to dissect the Bible in a way that is not taught in the way the churches are doing so that you can go deeper into it. So, mm -hmm. um, but I think, uh, I think Halloween, you know, is one of those uh, absolutely extraordinary celebrations that just is, is celebrating a history that i think people you know ought to know more about and in north well, america go ahead oh no yeah i, I mean it, it kind of touches on you know uh, a question that i had like like where did monsters come from where where did the uh you know the concept of these these werewolves vampires and and, and all these other things and and, and you said it, it it comes from the Nephilim, who yeah. technically are, if we're going to get a little bit deep here real quick, is 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 the fallen angels, right? I mean, um, well, you have, you have the 
Yeah, I would say you have the Nephilim, which means fallen ones. Okay. That would be the angels, and a Nephal is the root word for Nephil, for Nephilim. But they're two distinct groups. So the Nephilim are the angels, the Nephilim are the first creation of giants. So they're demigods. They're the offspring of gods or fallen angels and human females. And they were given an immortal spirit. Um, but their the bodies in the physical okay. world, yeah, as a demigod and, you know, a, a spirit that was passed on to them by the God and other superhuman characteristic or traits. And that's where you sort of get the word superhero from mm -hmm. superhero, you know, you know, is basically a word that was understood as these demigods in the ancient times they are called heroes, whether it's in Sumer with like uh, Gilgamesh of a rook after the flood whether or not it is the heroes of Greek mythology, like Hercules, for example, that son of Zeus and a human female after the flood. Mm -hmm. And they could do supernatural things, and they had that sort of supernatural life. But when their bodies died, or they were killed suddenly with a, a beheading, for example, which sort of, sort of leads you into the vampire uh, doorway to a little bit on how to kill a vampire, how to kill an Nephilim. Yeah. Uh, you have <clears throat> uh, an understanding with with these uh, with with these giants that because they have this counterfeit spirit, that spirit doesn't go to sleep like humans, and so it's not mm -hmm. permitted into heaven, and okay. it's not permitted to sleep. So it's going to do one of two things: it's going to wander the earth looking for a place of rest which is why it's going to go into animals or into humans and possess them and you'll have two spirits as in one soul and body uh, which usually is not a symbiotic relationship unless it's with a shaman uh, experience where they're inviting that 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 uh, spirit in whether it's angelic or demonic for for greater wisdom and talents and things like that but you have this uh the spirit that doesn't have to be wandering if they're given all of the rituals and things in, in the religion to find their way through the underworld, which is what you see in all of the ancient polytheist religions just told in a different way of how to get into Hades, how to get into Sheol um, without going to the abyss and and not finding your entrance into into the uh uh the land of the other world so they're prepared to do that but things can interrupt that like being killed so the egyptians would look at and also you know the the sumerians and pretty much all around the ancient world the worst way for a giant to die was to lose his head because it would happen so quickly and they didn't have the ability to repair themselves which sort of goes back to that root word of Rafa 7495 that I was talking about is healing because they mm. were thought to be able to be self-healing, whether it's through sarcophagi or just natural he healing traits. So if that happened to them, they're the ones that are thought that went to, that go to the abyss, to the abyss prison, to the pit prison and locked in the sides of the abyss prison with the other gods that are uh locked in there with them so that's kind of how that sort of connects in there and who who keeps them locked in there uh... well it's it's interesting so you have two different versions of that like for example in 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 pistis sophia which is a gnostic gospel you have a depiction of all of these watchers these archons right because okay. they're the ones mm -hmm. who created the giants and they're there for the crimes against creation and the crimes against um humanity as the christian side would go and they're put in there by opposing gods so in poly polytheism you have this dualist sort of concept of good versus evil within the religion and then sort of outside the religion as it as it goes to the followers of the god of the bible and inside the religion how that sort of breaks down is is you always have black magic and white magic you have mm -hmm. good uh fairy kings and evil fairy kings you have good giants like hercules and you have evil giants and you have um this dualism that's always sort of being played out whether it's within polytheism polytheism or outside and how they use that knowledge biblically they've been put in there 
because of the crimes that they that they did that I had talked about the crimes against humanity and the crimes against creation for creating a lot of these other creatures so let's say a god like Tiamat or Bast in the in the Egyptian religion and they all have one of those gods or goddesses that create all of these different kinds of chimera type of 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 creatures so when you look at Frankenstein that's kind mm -hmm. of like a low tech human way of trying to create a new giant or human in a chimera sort of effect because they're putting in parts from you know other humans but you could just as easily do parts from other animals as the chimera would sort of talk about interesting okay um so this this abyss is is technically hell is that what we would call it well uh, hell is a word that is probably uh, misdefined um, and what happens biblically and in the world we know it combines three terms into one which it shouldn't it should be three different places so hell as we understand it in the bible uh, includes the underworld or sheol or hades okay. um, and that's where the the gods of polytheism that's kind of like their heaven that's what they would call it and there's a thalemic tree that goes up into the world to become the world tree is where the power would come from. And that's why it's such an important place to get there in portals. And within that other world is the pit prison or the abyss prison. So this is long sort of tube thing that, that uh, is there to lock up not only the, uh, the fallen angels who have been put in there, but also there's demons that are in the sides of the abyss as as the book of ezekiel 32 talks about and so you have one other aspect so you have abyss that is the tartarus prison that's in hades um, as tartarus is is the greek version of that and then you have the lake of fire and that's mm. a completely different place so okay it would be it would have been best if the translations into english had translated them directly or a specific term that would identify you know the you know hades from hell and because i look at hell as being the hellfire or the lake of fire and or and also separate the the meaning of of the abyss prison so that again you gotcha. can be more specific in the understanding yeah no gotcha um this underworld this abyss uh <laughs> Is, is it a physical place? Is, is it interdimensional? What, I mean, wh wh where is this place? Again, a lot of people have a different views on it. Um, okay. There tends to be a consensus in some of the groups that it's in the earth. And I, I kind of agree with that, but not in the same way as in like hollow earth, but that would be in the hollow earth sort of physical aspect i think okay. it occupies the same space as the inner earth and it is in another dimension and that's why you need portals and things like that to get to gotcha so yeah i i, I think it's uh kind of akin to the Raphaim or the Rapium that are talked about in the Ugaritic text so not only did the gods like Baal the Baalim of Mount Hermon as being described as that pantheon of gods use portals to go to the underworld so did the Raphaim kings both when they lived and when they died so they both had an ability to go into that other world so that's why when you get things passed down in in fairy lore like king arthur or i guess mm -hmm. more technically grail lore but that's got a fairy queen with guinevere and you've got a, a fairy to author dunna and descendant named king arthur and yeah. i won't go into all of the allegory on that but i mean they're they're looking for Anne win mm -hmm. that's the other world right, right. so um and hmm. so that's why that's a significant part of fairy lore as well because it's part of the same groups of beings uh that were part of that whole culture and organizational structure both before the flood and then again shortly after the flood yes pre-diluvian and post-diluvian right yes yes so this underworld uh again i'm gonna talk about it again here it's it's is is this a place that people go to 
uh, also when they die. Like, like say the evil, uh, it, let's just, you know, hell, hell. I know it's a different place. I think, you know, the lake of fire, whatever. But this this place that we call the underworld, the abyss, uh, is it just for the, the demigods um, and the fairy realm? The You know what I'm saying? I mean, when we yeah. die, if we are evil, okay, is this a place that we would go to? No, no, okay. no, not no. Okay. Um, humans sleep. And I heard this too. And this is something yep. I'm very interested in you talking about. So humans sleep when they die. They're not yes. technically dead, which, yeah, which brings me to you believing that there's no reincarnation or is there? Well, reincarnation is a part of a polytheist sort of doctrine, okay. but reincarnation, you know, in terms of accessing that, has to be done through the mysteries and becoming an adept and then it's basically designed for you know the the in the ancient times it was designed for the demigods and then they're descending dynastic royals the kings and that's is still sort of the same way today that they're trying to prepare themselves for that afterlife because their spirits didn't go to sleep and the belief would be for people within that system today would be the same thing that their 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 spirit would not go to sleep so they want to be able to find their way into the polytheist heaven which is hades right and and be and be safe from the other forces that are out there uh, which are the evil forces in their dualistic religion so um but humans are said to sleep over and over and over and over in the Bible, like hundreds of times. I I, I tried to count it how many times I just got <laughs> okay. so many. I just had to stop. It was just ridiculous. So, so is that part of the reincarnation? Uh, the, no. the sleeping over and over or, or continue? Um, sleeping is, 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 we're told as Christians that you will um, suffer the first death, which is that sleep state. And then after that, there's going to be a, a, a resurrection. Okay. Um, but resurrection as being um, angel-like, even though we have human fathers, we're going to be adopted to be like angels in the future time. The people who won't be reaching the future time will have a specific day where they're being judged. Now, some of those, I expect, will be judged into Im Im immortality because as the book of Romans talks about there, there, if you have, we're not aware of God or not aware of Jesus, it, it's going to evaluate, they're going to evaluate you on what's in your heart. But the ones that fail that test are going to go to the second death in the lake of fire. So they're actually going to die, which is different than the sentencing for the fallen angels or the demon spirits or the people who take the mark of the beast in the end time. They're going to go to the lake of fire and they're going to be tormented forever. So there's a so difference. That's hell. Yeah. That, yeah. That would be, yeah, it's not a staging area like the abyss. <laughs> right. No, <laughs> no, no. no. And, and the Bible doesn't talk about a purgatory. So that's not there either. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, well, listen, what, what, what is your take? And, and, and I, I know you got, you know, really strong beliefs and really strong stance um, on a lot of these topics. But uh, again, for the reincarnation part of things, like, like th there are stories of kids who remember their past lives. I mean, what are your thoughts on, on, on those types of things? I mean, is it real? Are, are they really reliving a past life and remembering something from the past? Right. So if you sort of understand the connection to a polytheist ability to contact the spiritual realm, whether or not it's the elementals that might still be in the other world, or it's the demon spirits, or it's some sort of angel, angelic spirit of the many different orders of, of the angels, is that there are ways to sort of do that and sometimes it's done through ritual sometimes it's done through sort of drugs sometimes it's done through um, certain types of, of meditation and things like yoga sometimes it it uh, can be done through putting yourself into a different state of mind sort of altered states as that old movie was sort of alluding to right in hypnosis 
you are going into that process. So the question gets to be is, are you actually speaking to the person that's in a state of sleep and getting their memories? Or are you getting a demonic spirit hmm. that you're actually talking, is talking through that body and giving you information that they would be aware of or maybe even lived? Okay. Interesting. Interesting uh, points there. Um, huh. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, I have a, a pretty strong belief on um, because just because of the stories I've heard, like, you know, you know, of the children who have, uh, you know, died in like World War II and the kid's eight years old and he's, you can name the street where he died and passed. But uh, you made some good points, that's for sure. Um, and remember, everybody in the chat, if you do got questions, uh, feel free to ask. Um, everybody's loving the show so far. Rich Cat says this is one of the best paranormal tonight so far uh, thank you rich cat uh definitely very very uh interesting uh stuff and again check out the link uh, well there you go tracy thank you gary wayne's uh, oh no that's appearance of last time uh, on the show uh we covered a lot of stuff on there but um yeah definitely check out his book it's in the description below and give it a read boy you can have that and just catch up on it over probably a year or you could sit and read it in about a couple of weeks maybe i don't know that's that's a quick read i don't know <laughs> yeah take a little longer than that <laughs> yeah probably probably okay so yeah. so, so i was, so, was going to say maybe what i should have you know also said is is okay you know i'm not necessarily trying to uh convince people of one position what i what i tend to do is try and provide information what i like what i would like people to do is to search things out for themselves in a very critical way mm -hmm. in their analyzing so that they can make really good decisions not just you know I, i'm right. a contrarian so i don't necessarily just accept what somebody says or what somebody says something says i want to verify it as best as i can for myself and when you've gone through that process then feel comfortable and confident in whatever your belief is because we're all here trying to figure out why we're here Ex oh you better believe that like, like listen uh, gary i, I want to know what's going on after i pass away i mean th it doesn't everybody that that's the main question that uh everybody has like what happens um again if you've got you know pure belief in in, in your religion and um depending on what your religion is uh, you know, then that's a different story. But um, faith is one thing. And uh, somebody who's skeptical and, uh, and needs answers like me um, needs proof and facts. And I need to hear everything from everyone. So, you know, it's it's just how it is for me. Um, but yeah, let's see, where, where can I go from that? I mean, a, again, we've touched on uh, all of the like monsters and stuff like that, that technically have... Uh, you know, I, there was a question that I was um, interested in, uh, pre-Diluvian and post-Diluvian. Uh, the, the giants are different. Uh, I've heard you say before, they were much, much larger before the flood and much, much smaller after. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, I think so. I think it has to do with Genesis 6-3, where God limits the life to 120 years. Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is the creation story of the giants right in the middle of it when that's done god limits life so that you don't have this immortal god in the physical world with a physical body right, right. Um, because gods are spirit beings that can take a physical form but their natural home is in a, in a in a different dimension and so one deduces that there are other restrictions that are involved here uh, you know they don't live as long they they may still have a counterfeit spirit um they may uh but they may not have the same sort of healing abilities um but things are changing and they may not have the same they definitely don't have the same fertility um capabilities so that the raphaim they're part of the terrible ones of the of the old testament after the flood and the terrible ones are a branch this branch of rephaim and terrible ones is defined in hebrew not only as being strong and mighty and stuff like that but also as having a fertility issue 
So when I mentioned okay. the Ugaritic texts before that they're doing rituals, they're also doing a lot of fer fertility rituals to bring Baal and Ashtaroth, post-Diluvian gods. Um, and Baal is the son of El, and he's an offspring god that takes over for El who was reigning before the flood. And, he, hmm. and what, and what the, the Rephaim are trying to do is they want to bring Baal and Ashtaroth back so that they can produce more Rephaim demigods because they're having difficulty reproducing and that doesn't happen so they're going to have to thereafter start intermarrying and bringing in some humans to continue their their existence right it'll be diluted in terms of the bloodlines but it'll it, it will be um at least continued from a dynastic sort of perspective because they're all kings and queens and warriors and priests and things like that so that would be, I think, the point where there's a change, that anything that's being created in, in incursions after that would be, would, have, would be smaller and less things passed on. So what other things might be passed on? Well, one of the things that a lot of these beings that, that, are, that people dress up in, in terms of Halloween, a mm -hmm. lot of them are changelings, right? Right, like yep. elementals or the the fairies are changelings, werewolves are changelings. There's a lot of, yep. yeah, there's a lot of that going on, and it's thought that the original Nephilim had that ability that they could change into different sort of forms, and you see that also in the vampires, as that's you know allegorized, and the shape shifting werewolves. So, mm -hmm. um, so that was a trait that the that their parents had. Uh, because they could change into any form that they wanted to in the physical world. And so when they took that physical form, that DNA would have been passed on. But there seems to be after the flood that that isn't as, you know, like at least a strong capability. I, I actually don't really find that changeling capability uh, so much after the flood, except for the werewolves mythos. But that's a different creation of a Nephilim kind of character through uh, Zeus, who's a uh, post-Diluvian offspring god and king Lycaon, um, hmm. who gets on the wrong side. He lives in Arcadia. Uh, he gets on the wrong side of Zeus. So Zeus changes him and all of his family into werewolves that are changelings um, as punishment. And... Uh, so they can go back from having human form and a, and a werewolf form and a whole bunch of other, other things that will go along with that that are centered around the moon worship. Okay. And, and let me ask you, does, uh, does any of the reproducing with humans, uh, is there a connection in any way with what we call the... Um, the aliens now who who come down and well we believe to come down and reproduce or try to mate to so, create you know what i'm saying yeah. you, you see where i'm going yeah so whether or not it's like diana of the roman pantheon uh thought to be associated with the uh, tuatha dodanan as a mother goddess there as well i won't go through that sort of rabbit trail because that gets a little bit long but they're basically she's part of that mother goddess uh crossover into the tuatha do and Anne. she's the queen of the fairies right she's okay. the queen um of a lot of in individuals and you get gods and goddesses in all the different pantheons that are creating through sexual at least in the mythology and the religion of it a sexual relationship somehow with uh, humans or other creatures to create these little people and there's many different kinds of them and they have uh so they're i would call them like a nephilim kind of creation but somehow different a they're smaller so okay. they're not given that gift of size they're given gifts and traits and have a position in the hierarchy but right at the bottom like they are huh. <laughs> you know so they'll and I talk about three kinds of elementals in, in my book, uh, but there is a fourth one that would be a little bit higher than the little ones, and that's the salamanders, right? They are lizard, or not lizard, they are reptilian type beings that are, you know, let's say human height or maybe a little bit taller, okay. kind of like how the, the cache or the serpent is described before the Eden incident. I don't know whether there's a connection there or not. There might be, but you've got... Um, 
good looking ones um, that are, you know, basically part of the little people. And, you know, they include little ones like neroids, sprites, mermaids, nymphs, um, sylphs, um, and known in First Nations because they have they have this little people um, legacy all over the world, and they have the same same groups. They're known a lot in a lot of the First Nations. Uh, they have other names too, but as the Dogwoods. Mm -hmm. um, they're also associated with Bigfoot, but that's another rabbit hole. You have the the mischievous ones uh, in the little people, like leprechauns, and particularly these trickster ones. Uh, are part of this trickster spirit, both of the demigods and of the gods, is sort of kind of connected into that hierarchy. Pixies, brownies, Menuhe and Hawaii imps, uh, and also known as the Laurel people in a lot of First Nations names. Uh, you have the ugly ones, and I'm going to get to your alien connection <laughs> here soon. Okay. Um, these are the ugly ones. They include uh, like dwarves and goblins and trolls and dark elves and little elves as opposed to the larger white elves. That's another rabbit hole, but different sort of segment in the hierarchy. And uh, they also include the gnomes. And the gnomes are the ones that looked after knowledge, techno technology, and genealogies. And one of those are uh, a group called the Greys. And in their fairy mythos, all throughout our history, they come through fairy domains or portals, fairy mounds, all sorts of shades, all sorts of different names for the same term. And they come through and they kidnap people, uh, sometimes for as many as 14 days, um, and then return them. And usually they've had sexual experimentations on them, things like that. And the knowledge that's been collected on that is they're looking for DNA to sort of continue their reproductive capabilities because they seem to have had that infertility issue that the Raphaim have. So those descriptions that I put in my book are the same descriptions that are for a gray alien. Okay, no, I love know, that. And you, wouldn't yeah. know, and you wouldn't know the difference yeah. unless you were told one was a fairy abduction one is a, a gray alien abduction. So hmm. if aliens come from other dimensions versus other planets, mm -hmm. which in a lot of the alien mythos, they do come through portals and things like that, yeah. then they could be just different forms of creatures that have been here all along from the ancient past that were saved from the flood through in the earth, in another dimension, off the earth, however they were saved, mm -hmm. um, that also maintained that technology and that knowledge. Because again, the polytheist religions are trying to communicate with them and, and get this knowledge to advance the human civilization. I love that, Gary. No, you put that very well. Um, it explains a lot. Um, is there any mention of what this other, because evidently there's even right now to this day, there's a lot going on on the other side, if we call it that, the other dimension where they um, live. I mean, yeah. You know, what, what's, um, is there yeah, any not, description? They're, 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 they're not sitting there doing nothing. No, right? they're not. They're doing something. So it's just, right. what are they doing? Right. So, right, right. I mean, the whole image in my head is like, I want to, I want to know what it looks like. I, I want to know, yeah. is it the same plane? Uh, does it look like what we are seeing just on a different dimensional level? Um, is it somewhere totally different? Does it state that anywhere in the Bible? Uh, what that other side, other dimension looks like? No, it, it doesn't give us a lot, but um, mm -hmm. it is a it is a place that has, you know, in that dimension, it has a physical sort of nature to it, right? Yeah. But different than what's here. It could be just on a on a different sort of wavelength. Uh, mm -hmm. or vibration, or it could be just, it could be different matter altogether because it's in like, like an alternate universe almost, right? So yeah, um, we do get descriptions in the Book of Enoch uh, mm -hmm. and it seems to be a very large place with, you know, mountains and things like that. So um, 
it seems hmm. to be it seems to have you know a place that where people want to go so you get a lot of polytheist uh accounts of it that you know where people are trying to go to nirvana or um right and there's a different sort of name for it in almost every culture right yeah. uh, so and they all lead in through a portal or a gateway and all into the in into the earth but it seems to be again in those accounts it seems to be not physically in the earth that you're like being teleported through that gateway into you know another another location and some of those entrances are through caves just as caves are you know thought of as portals in a lot of um accountings of this and this is probably where we get a lot of like spirit activity and and hauntings and and things and like that. activity yeah and bigfoot like big yes yeah. yes yes Again, we've talked. We, I've talked about that on the show many, many times. You know, you, you'll see big foot, you know, tracks, and they just stop and they're gone. You know, yeah. so um, yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody, mahogany sins. There's a lot of people in the chat. Rich Cat Ranch says Enoch removed by higher ups. Yes, we've talked about the fallen angels, and you know, I don't know if we'll get to uh, in depth about that tonight but yeah we, we check out the other show definitely i, I know we touched on falling angels fallen angels then but um but yeah no i'm just so intrigued with this so my thoughts are that um you do you believe that the universe holds uh, other life too i'm just throwing that out there um there there's no reason why it, it couldn't okay okay right you know and and particularly from a, a biblical perspective, we're not told there isn't other life forms. In fact, we're told there is. Uh, it's just, it may be more of a definition as to where where actually they are and where they're coming from and how big the, how big the universe is. Um, it's, it's unlikely, I think, that there is life within our firmament, so to speak, which it would be whatever distance people want to argue from the earth to the sun because all of that is is, yeah. is within the firmament but we also know there's a there's the second universe biblically that is outside the firmament and that it could go forever um we're never mm -hmm. ever told that we're the only beings that that are created um so i i kind of leave that up for um yeah. <laughs> for others and so yeah for others uh, but so, so the bible there's many other kind of beings right that the bible's talking right. about yeah yeah so the bible could just be a reference for uh this solar system itself right or or this earth um and there may be other bibles and other parts of the universe that describe what's going on there or am i wrong well yeah because if you think about what's promised in, in the Christian faith for eternity is that you're going to be resurrected to be like angels. And then God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. But again, heavens is defined three different ways where mm. spirit, spirit realm is the, the second heaven, which is beyond the firmament and within the firmament. So the Greek isn't clear as to which heaven that it's talking about there. So it yeah. could mean just a new firmament and earth. Okay. Um, that includes the sun and that as things that we might be doing would be things like, let's say Satan was described of doing with his wide uh, spread trade. That seems to be sort of more than just the physical earth. So one might deduce from that, that there are things to be done in the rest of the universe or, th or beings that are already there that we'll be in contact with that God has already done as part of his plan we just we just don't know right from a christian perspective right. if you if you play the mathematical game um in a limited way you could say that there should be life everywhere in that universe except that you generally get the mathematical zero very quickly in every calculation that you might make <laughs> so that but that doesn't sort of um take away from the fact that other beings couldn't have been created on other planets gotcha gotcha um i am going to touch on this again <laughs> it seems like every time i talk to you i, I kind of uh 
touch on this, but we do got new people in here. And what the heck? I want to ask you again because th there is a show out there. I, I told Gary he's got to see it. Midnight Mass. <laughs> um, uh, and and I've talked about talked about it with the, the fallen angels and the vampires. Um, you know, th there's a lot of similarities when it comes down to everything I've heard you talk about and others where the fallen angels seem to be or could possibly be uh, vampires or what we call vampires. And if that's the case, Gary, uh, are they still around some of them, some of those fallen angels who some might consider angels? I, I mean, vampires. Uh, could they possibly still be around and, and, and roaming the earth now? Okay, so... Two things on that is that vampires have a relationship to the Nephilim, and I'll bring that back to the fallen angels as well. Okay. But with the sort of Nephilim, what they were doing before the flood was they wanted to make sure they were going to live forever with their bodies in the physical world, right? They didn't want it to die. So they started to drink blood to try and get that life force of humans because biblically we're told life is in the blood mm -hmm. and they wanted that life to extend their lives and to give them uh, higher levels of cognitive abilities and so they would kill people on mass to try and continue to do that but we also have a lot of sacrifices to the gods not just to the demigods but to the actual gods like baal and uh, Quetzalcoatl and all the different gods around the earth, right? They're just, it's just the history uh, is just overflows with that sort of aspect. So there's a thought that it's like a quickening from a spiritual level as opposed to a physical level of the drinking of the blood. The angels to acquire more power when, in the physical world want to possess that physical energy of your spirit so that they would not be necessarily drinking your blood, but they would want that uh, energy as opposed to the physical aspect uh, uh, of the blood and that they would prefer the most pure of the spirits, the young. That's why baby sacrifice was so popular and or the innocent that that spirit would be more pure and that energy more pure that would be more powerful. And that's kind of where the quickening aspect of the spiritual nature. And that's a concept that is well understood in the occult. We actually get the word quickening in the Bible. And it's used at the time when Jesus has been crucified and he's gone down to the uh the abyss prison in in first peter three and he's talking to the spirits that are imprisoned uh, before he's going to be resurrected and so it's this quickening life force that's also in the highlander movies which is a fairy allegory of the fairy yeah. bloodlines as opposed to the dragon bloodlines mm -hmm. of the nephilim and instead of drinking blood they're actually taking on that physical that spiritual energy as a demigod to be a more powerful god within the physical universe there's this common thing that the that the that the fallen angels or the gods require this kind of worship and sacrifice and to me it can only mean that there's a there's some sort of feeding on one aspect a physical feeding on the other aspect is the spiritual feeding Okay, so and you do believe that they are roaming the roaming the earth still? Well, not all of them went to the abyss. So, and there's a lot of so them. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, if we look at the ones that went to the abyss, at least from a biblical perspective, and mm -hmm. seemingly from the Gnostics are fairly close on this, um, is that there's a limited number that went to the abyss, just the ones who, as I said, did the crimes and. Uh, and both before and after the flood. So the Baalim disappeared very quickly after creating the uh, the giants again after the flood and whatever other creatures that they might have created after the flood. Hmm. In the book of Daniel 7 and Revelations 5, you get uh, thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 of the angels that are sitting in front of God's throne. 
Revelation 12 says by that point in time, whether or not they all rebelled at once, but by the midpoint of the last seven years of this age, a full one third of them would have rebelled. So if 10,000 times 10,000 is a literal number, that's 100 million. So you could say 50 million or 33 million, however you want to calculate that for rebellious angels. Or if that's an allegorical number, like thousands and thousands that, that shows up in, in, the, in the verse in, in Daniel 7, it could be many more than that. So there are a lot of angels that rebelled that are not in the abyss. So there but could the be ones plenty that of are in the abyss are coming back in the end time. Okay. Well, oh, there you go. Yes, yes. Uh, coming back around to the end times. But yes, yeah, so there definitely could be vampires, um, whether in the way we think uh, Hollywood, you know, makes them yes. out to be or not. Well, because and if you look at it, there, there's the invisible ones and the visible ones right? Uh, that, that Christians are said that uh, we are fighting against. And yeah. whether or not you're polytheist and that's part of your belief system uh, of the invisible ones uh, and you look at them as as the good ones and we're the evil ones that's not really the point here the point is there's the spiritual beings mm -hmm. and what they would feed off of and the ones who would emulate them as in the demigods and the representatives as the royals on earth they would do a similar thing in the physical world however um that 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 is to be done and usually it's the blood drinking and the sacrifice yeah and it, it, it would also explain monsters right i mean sightings of monsters uh so-called the uh, you know whether it's the werewolf or uh you know the mothman or or anything of that such right i mean um there's sightings every single day uh yeah or dog yeah. Or dogmen or Bigfoot, um, yeah. which is a whole yeah. different topic, I guess. Uh, well, but just yeah. think about just think about a, a a god named Anubis, who is a jackal or a dog-like god. Yeah, and he created offspring as well in the Egyptian religion, and they lived in a city called Sinopolis, which is means dog city in Greek. Yes, and that he created, and this was a city of dog warriors. So that's a Nephilim kind of creature right yeah yeah no you listen uh the way you explain things and again this is your opinion through all your research and yep. everything you've come across it's up to everybody to make their own decision on things but listen there's there's sightings every single day and a lot of people just you know say ah you're crazy you know but what what you're talking about kind of you know kind of explains ex it yeah, it kind yeah. Of explains whether it, so. yeah whether or not you want to deal with that <laughs> or not that's uh, that's your choice as well but it, it's, exactly. it's, it's certainly an, an explanation and the other thing is is that what we do know is the technology before the flood was greater than what we have today and we know that by hmm. the things that they could build and do and the knowledge that came from the gods that developed along with the seven sacred sciences that were part of mysticism you know, we can't build the pyramids. We can't do Machu Picchu today. I mean, and that's just mm. the tip of the iceberg that they seemingly had a capability of doing. And then when you consider they had the ability to do chimera type of animals, which to me, kind of similar to, let's say, centaurs being created in a cloud. Mm -hmm. in some sort of something that's different than a Nephilim creation. There's a DNA aspect that is likely being involved involved especially with the chimera concept just as in the chimera they're putting together all sorts of different creatures in, into in into one animal through dna so that ability to manipulate dna in a way that we're just catching up to today so what other things did they actually create that are even more fantastic than the lion men or the dog men but other kinds of creatures and King yeah. Hababa of the Cedar Forest, he is a Chimera king at Mount Hermon <laughs> that is just unbelievable with the different parts that he has on them. And he's yeah. like a Nephilim king, but he's Chimera, a Chimera with all those different uh, animal type features. Oh my, just yes. So interesting. Uh, Dennis RTN, thank you very much for the $5 super chat. Says great show, Gary and Dino. Thank you. Uh, Tracy said, uh, listen, if you got questions, um, to throw them in there. Uh, don't want them to go to waste, right? So if, if you got a question, definitely put it in the chat. 
Um, yeah, I'm we, just, can, we, can, we can talk about if you want to know where jack lanterns come from or the trick or treat, we can talk about things like that. So we can go a lot of different directions here. Well, geez. Yeah. yeah listen, I, I always go dark. I always go deep. But, you know, yeah. listen, you, you mentioned trick or treat and jack o' lanterns. Yeah. Tell me about jack o' lanterns. Let, let's go there. Okay. Well, jack o' lantern is a. Tuatha de Danan kind of uh, legend and and uh, mythos. So, and it comes from the trickster spirit of mm -hmm. gods and demigods in terms of that sort of alignment in terms of the column that it would be involved on. And so, in the original hero, because he, Jack is a hero, he's a Tuatha de Danan giant, okay. and he tricks the devil. And of course, devils are part of the uh, Halloween mythos as well. And the devil, biblically, is Diablos from Greek in, in a word that's associated with Satan. Um, mm -hmm. Other words for devil, other than references in the Bible to, uh, to Satan, all the other ones is a demon spirit or a demon spirit, uh, as it goes back to Greek. So two different things. So one of the reasons why I like to take verify things back in the original language so i know who they're actually talking about in the bible and so and he tricks the uh, the devil a couple of times in 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 this sort of mythos and so eventually though uh the devil's going to win this battle because you, you're not going to beat satan um <laughs> and and the devil forces him to uh, wander the, when he dies to wander the earth as a spirit or as a demon spirit right okay. so again you see that consistency in, in the narrative and so uh the devil uh didn't let him go to hades so he had to wander like the demon spirits are looking for a place to rest and he, he had to do this because of his trickery or that trick trickery uh, trickster spirit and jack wandered the night with a burning coal that was put into a hollowed out turnip right okay. so okay. it would be used as a lantern now hmm. we use pumpkins in north america now, they grow better here but in the old celtic and old irish they didn't have pumpkins <laughs> they had things like turnips and that's what they would use so when they were doing jack-o-lanterns it would be turnips that they were doing and this is sort of the basis of, of the jack-o-lantern so he'd be wandering the earth with this lantern and that's why you get the word jack-o-lantern from jack um uh the hero and what's also interesting about um jack jack of the lantern is that he is not only a hero of an old old Irish myth, he's also related to Jack the Green um, and the Green Man. And it also goes back into, you know, that whole wicker uh, ritual aspect as well. So this is this is an individual that has uh, a name that is very much of the occult. Because you have not only Jack of the Green that mm -hmm. is related not only back to the Wicker stuff, but also back to a god as he's connected to, is understood as Jack of the Green as a light aspect for Sir Nunos, which is a nature god like a pan god, and is equivalent to the god Cern in the or in the in, in the Etruscan pantheon or pan the pan god in the Greek pantheon, and uh, he mm -hmm. takes. Uh, he takes uh, Jack of the Green is 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 sort is part of the of the hunt of Saman, so the hunt of uh, All Hallows Eve, mm -hmm. and Jack is also sort of the same name that you get for Jack in the Box, like the spirit that comes out as a box with this clown <laughs> face. Yeah, <laughs> clowns are a trickster spirit, right? um in this ancient <laughs> understanding mm. and that it's the spirit coming out of a box that's going to or a portal that's going to uh scare you or uh do horrible things to you you also get jack frost as another jack as a spirit of a that goes into a, a snowman jack uh 
uh, also is in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. So again, another connection. Yeah. Jack is one of those names that sort of goes all, all the way through. So the jack-o'-lantern is very much part of the old Nephilim sort of mythos as well. Yeah, no. And I see the questions, so I'm going to get to them now. But uh, yeah, I've got the clowns right around me. So uh, why I'm uh, infatuated with clowns, uh, Gary, I have no idea. But anyways, um, listen, uh, really quick, really quick, because you talk about the devil and then I'll get to the questions because I got, I think, two or three questions there. Um, the devil. Uh who are the the devil because it's not just one there's satan and then there's the devils who are the disciple disciples of satan right am i wrong um yeah there's a hierarchy of the fallen realm mm -hmm. and it very much is the same hierarchy of the loyal realm there's a couple you know twists of course in there so you have uh satan uh hail l as i like to call him as his name it goes back in hebrew as opposed to Lucifer, which is an Italian word, which I don't know why is in the King James Version Bible. But mm. underneath uh, Satan in the book of Enoch are the seven Satans, which seems to be sort of an equivalent to the seven archangels that's in, in the biblical loyal angels uh, to, to the God of the Bible aspect. And these seven Satans are you know, like his chief lieutenants. And then you have the tens of tens after that, right? right. So you've got i would sort of limit the actual satan word or devil word to that to that group of, of of fallen angels that doesn't mean you can't be disciples of the devil gotcha. uh, and just as satan is the prince of the devils and the leader of the devils as the leader of all the different beings that are part of that realm mm -hmm. um so you can have disciples of the devils which would typically be understood as humans or uh bloodlines of, of, of the nephilim who are practicing and becoming satanic and wanting to be like disciples of jesus right they're doing the same types of things and doing the same types of miracles sort of in an inverse way um but yeah you could have disciples that way typically the disciples would be understood more in the occult as in the occult religions as being the hierarchy of the religion so the the adept priests right mm -hmm. nice nice okay so just wanted to clarify that for sure uh so tracy has a question says gary with reference to the end time uh, do mm -hmm. you feel that time is near within our lifetime? What will be the telltale sign, in your opinion? What do you foresee in the timeline to be? So I think we are in the fig tree generation. And for people who aren't familiar with end time prophecy is Jesus made a, set, a specific set of predictions in a chronological order to his disciples just before he was crucified. And that's in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and Luke 21. And he gave three overarching signs. And the fig tree generation is one of those overarching signs that sort of defines the events. And so that defines as a generation that all the events are going to be fulfilled that he talked about. So there's one specific generation. And the question gets to be is, is what's the fig tree allegory? And, mm -hmm. and most, I would say all of the allegory that's in end time prophecy is defined within the Bible. So in the fig tree, uh, you have one instance just before he does the, the signs of the end, end times that he gives to his disciples who ask him for those signs. He's going to eat from a, from a tree and then he's going to kill the fig tree. And the fig tree, um, and this is just before he goes into the temple and creates havoc in the temple, right? Mm. And the fig tree is understood as the visible southern kingdom of Judah, as opposed to the northern king of Israel that was lost into the, uh, into the world in the time of the Assyrians. And so the southern kingdom is known as the fig tree and the northern king is known as the vine. And so it's this fig tree. It's the people that are living in Jerusalem at that time that he kills because it has no more fruit. It's lost its spiritual fruit. And then he's 
shortly right after that, almost leads right into it, he makes a prediction that all of the temple and Jerusalem is going to be overturned. Now, we do know that in end time prophecy, the southern kingdom, or at least the remnant of the Judaic people, because uh, there's a lot of people who don't believe that the people of the Jews are at least 100% of that visible Ju Judaic people today, but at least a remnant of them, they have to be back in the land of the covenant in the end time. And they have to occupy Jerusalem in the end time because they're talked about it in that sort of reference. Hmm. And that's, you know, they're there at the time of the abomination when Antichrist is crowned in Jerusalem and southern Judea and are being attacked before that in end time prophecy. So there's a requirement. So then that says, okay, 1947, Israel declared independence. So that could be a start date. But again, they didn't have Jerusalem then. So I, I think if we're in the fig tree generation, it begins with uh, the taking of Jerusalem. And then we go into the age of or the, the years of that generation of the birth pangs or the beginning of sorrows that will get uh, stronger. So earthquakes, uh, pestilence, uh, pandemic and wars and rumors are war. And those are all of the catastrophes that happens you know, through the hmm. seals and through the trumpets and through the bowl rass, they just get stronger, right? As you get closer right. to that. So I think if we are in the fig tree generation, we're in there. The trouble is, is, is we don't know how long a generation is. Book of Exodus says 40 years. The book of Psalms says 70 years. And Genesis hmm. 6, 3, as we talked about earlier, limits life to 120 years. We're also told it doesn't huh. have to, to, be the full length of that generation. All Jesus says is all of those um, events that he predicted would happen within that generation. So if it's if it's Jerusalem and it's 70 or 120 years, we're getting closer to that first window. I don't think 40 years is, is uh, because, I mean, that's 2017 and it's already passed uh, for the 1947 declaration. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Very good question. Um, Dennis also asks, uh, did the Egyptians uh, have knowledge of DNA? Was the Sphinx and Anubis real? I, well, I think the, uh, I think they did have knowledge of DNA. Um, you have uh, the serpent as being sort of imagery for uh, the wisdom and the knowledge that is in in the Heliopolis religion, you know, in the time of Moses that, you know, is based on the religions before that. And the uh, Heliopolis center was a center for medicine as well and the development of medicine. And the symbol of mystery schools was the serpent. And the symbol of Ta, uh, it was at times shown as a you know two serpents around a staff, similar to uh, what you have seen, what you see in medical associations, and or, or this uh, the the staff of Escapoles or Asepoles, depending on how you want to pronounce that from the Greek um, uh, mythos and pantheon, who was the god of medicine, and his son was Hippocrates, who they take the Hippocratic oath for. And uh, the daughter was Hygieia, who the pharmaceuticals take in their more ancient imagery as the bowl of Hygieia, who was the sister of, of, of uh, Hippocrates. So you have that DNA symbol that comes through ancient ology, including the Egyptians. And then you have that DNA manipulation before the flood and seemingly again shortly after the flood while the gods were still walking amongst humans. And then as they started to lose kind of that knowledge. So yes, I think they had that knowledge uh, and they knew about okay. DNA. Um, it's just too much of it in their, in, in their ancient imagery to ignore. So the Sphinx it is thought to either have had a face of a human or the head of a lion. Uh, nobody mm. really knows, mm. um, but it could have been either, or could, or there could have been other ones that had each of. And I'll, I'll sort of make sense of that here in a second. It had kind of a body of a lion and 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 some other features. And in other cultures, they're called carobs. 
Mm -hmm. And they have different faces as well. They could have a face of an eagle as more of a griffin type of look, that right. sort of look. And or they'll have a, a, a head of an ox. And some of them have wings and some of them don't. Um, so you also have Anunnaki that have that are shown on release and they're known as watchers as well who are shown as having wings and these big thick legs and uh, a head of a human and a head of an eagle so if you look at the faces four faces of a cherubim you have a head of a man yes a head of an ox or a bull uh, you have a head of a lion and a head of an eagle I think sphinxes and Anunnaki represent cherubim watchers that would take one of those faces of choice when they visited the earth in, the, in a, with their physical way. Anubis is a god from the Ogdod set of gods, one of the parent gods, so one of the gods before the flood, as opposed to, let's say, Osiris would be an offspring god along with Isis after the flood, right? Mm -hmm. So he is a jackal god um amongst those ogdod gods and there's if you google o-g-d-o-a-d -D, you'll get all sorts of weird looking creatures that show up on the on the reliefs of that and very very important god as he was worshipped in in egyptian mythology so yes i think he was real and if he took that jackal form which i think he did um he would have produced jackal or dog nephilim that mm. is absolutely ripe around the whole world throughout ancient history and right up even to the middle ages so and even sightings of dog dog men to this day and we also get a barking dog in the bible who uh, is worshipped by the avim in the east more towards mesopotamia as opposed to uh, gaza and that barking dog is named uh, Nibaz. And so we get a god like that that's talked about in the Bible, just as we get a lion god, god named Nergal that's in Mesopotamia as well. And he had a lion's face. So again, that might be attributed to the lion men, uh, warriors, and Nephilim that are shown again both before and after the flood. Okay. Well, I tell you, Gary, uh, you know, I just sit here and just take it all in. But man, uh, as you're talking, I'm like going, I mean, we, we could speak almost every day for a full year and it, it just <laughs> things would just pop up and every I'll tell you, it's it's just fantastic. Um, Tracy has another question. Can you talk more about the watchers? Who were they and what was their role in history? What role do they play today? Where do you think they are now? So watchers are a group. Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. They are a group of angels or gods. And they're depicted in monotheist religions like Christianity and Judaism and the polytheist religions. So you have watchers that show up in uh, Sumer. And you also have the word draconta and dragon uh what that dragon comes from and draconta and dracont means watcher in the greek religion just as the urshua and the uh parent gods were known as watchers in egypt as well so it's a common sort of thing so biblically they're understood as four groups of angels that surround the throne of god and so if you can imagine Satan's throne as the rebellious throne of, 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 of Christianity or the chief god of polytheism, he has a throne too. And so he's going to have watcher rebellious angels as well. So biblically, though, uh, the word watchers is understood coming from the book of Enoch as being the archangels, the cherubim the seraphim which are the serpent faced angels and you have the ophanim which aren't a name that comes out of the bible but in the bible you have a chapter in ezekiel 1 and ezekiel 10 and ezekiel 3 that talks about in ezekiel's vision the chariot of god that is pulled by the cherubim um and within the wheels are these similar types of beings to the cherubim, but they have a different face. One of their four faces is a cherubim. 
which I'm not, it might be a, an amalgamation of the four of the four faces that we did. We're not told, but that's the right. one that's different. And so th that word for wheel, the wheel angels, um, goes back to the Hebrew word ofan, and the male plural is the I am. So that's the ofanim. So they are the wheel angels and watchers around the throne. And they're described in the book of Enoch as being the ones who do not sleep. They're always awake, so they're always watching around encircling the throne of God with the four different groups within the hierarchy of mm. those groups. And they would have on each of the sides of God the lower hierarchy of angels that would report up to the top rank that sits is represented by a represented number of the archangels, Ophanim, Cherubim, and Seraphim around the throne. So those are the watchers. Biblically, we get the word watcher that shows up in Daniel 4, four times, and it goes back to the Hebrew word, I ear, and that means to, to watch, uh, to be awake. And it goes back to another word of similar spellings. It's a U instead of an I in Hebrew that, that you don't sleep. And so watcher is I ear. And what's interesting about that is the de degraded watchers, as is the ones who would have rebelled, um, mm -hmm. are the sa'ir, which is S-A, sort of apostrophe, uh, I-Y, uh, I-Y-W-R for the spelling, sa'ir. And that's transliterated as satir for a devil goat god that shows up in the Bible. And so that means a hairy or a shaggy watcher or a shaggy goat god. Um, so satyrs, however you want to fit that connection in, are either another kind of watcher not mentioned, or they're a degraded watcher, but it, it's all rooted in the same word. So these watchers are the Anunnaki, just as they're depicted as a human face or a bird face, part of the Cherubim watchers as the Anunnaki are depicted, right? Uh, right. as we as we just talked about and these are the ones that provided knowledge to humankind and also are the ones who created the demigod giants okay and they're still here watching they're still here watching because not all of them went to the abyss so interestingly enough that's where it sort of crossovers into the ancient alien mythos that you get watchers or anunnaki in there as well just as you get the elemental beings that we talked about earlier in the show is part of the alien mythos as well. Very interesting. Um, fascinating, says Tracy. Uh, you know, Drun has a question. I'm not sure if it pertains to anything we're talking about. He says, Gary, do you have an opinion about what became of the God of the Bible? Is that a, a good question? <laughs> I don't know. I think, isn't the God of the Bible still supposedly... Yes. He, there, the, the, I mean, the God of the Bible is described as Alpha Omega, uh, the beginning and the end, and it's outside of physical time, right? And so it just is, uh, and so, and that's why you know, as as the Word of God appears in the fire, uh, before, you know, that Moses goes to, as, you know, the angel of the Lord is is the Word, um, is it says, I am. He just exists, right? And right. he's beyond time. So okay. he's still there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm not, again, I'm not sure exactly what you meant, Drune, but uh, there you go. Um, how about, uh, we're getting towards the bottom of the hour here, but um, let, let me talk about the mark of the beast. What, what do you think it is? Is it? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> I know that you could talk about uh, that for a yep. whole two hours. I know. Well, but... I'll, I'll, I'll try and do it quickly. <laughs> okay. um, first thing is, is, I think it's still developing. Okay. I think it's a number of technologies that will, that are being developed in parallel lanes that okay. will come together. Uh, I think there is an AI technology that's involved that's going to provide uh, the ability, as with quantum mechanics, to supply knowledge, like from the Atma particle, um, 
that's in other dimensions. So that technology allows the search for the Atma particle in multiple dimensions at one time. And the Atma particle that comes out of the betas and the up and shads is the, uh, an invisible particle that you can't measure as opposed to one that you can that merges with the one that you can. And it's the source of knowledge that sends that knowledge through uh, the universe, through quantum entanglement instantaneously. And to provide godhood, which is the mark, one of the things the mark is going to promise, it's going to have to have immortality and it's going to have to have unlimited knowledge. So they need to provide that. So you need that kind of technology that's going to go in it. It's going to uh, have to be a technology that can handle the new currency, whether it's an advanced form of cryptocurrency or something still developing. It's going to be part of that because of the buy or sell aspect. It's got to have an AI because uh, it's going to know who, who doesn't have the mark um, that will be hunted down to, to be uh, beheaded or killed. Um, it is going to be something that's going to be able to offer physical immortality in the physical world to offer godhood to evolve to the new level of godhood as the new age and polytheism hmm. likes to sort of look at it in a very i know i'm using a simplistic term there but offer that kind of a godhood aspect and this is going to have to be something that's going to be implanted because it's going to be in the forehead or the right hand. So it's going to have sit on your skin or under the skin somehow, some way, or I think some sort of implant, right? So, and so that sort of saying. merges with the Davos community and their projection that they want to have an implant that can administer digital uh, medicine to people uh, at the DNA level and below through all sorts of high-level technologies that will be sort of connected into a master system, right? Mm -hmm. So right. I think, again, you could go on and talk about this for a very long period of time, but you get sort of the idea that this is technology that will be merged as part of a loyalty oath to Antichrist at the time. And people are going to want to take it because they don't want to die from famine and wars and earthquakes and all the horrible things that are going on. They want to have that medication that's going to uh, pro provide that. And that they're actually going to believe Antichrist is the long-awaited Messiah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's... <clears throat> You just hit me with a lot there, because uh, <laughs> again, I, th I think you can do a whole show on the mark of the beast. I mean, listen, you can. You there, can. there's like I would I want to ask you right now, but we don't have time. Like, where is the where did you get all the facts that like you can back all this up with? You know what I mean? Because you threw a lot out there the, the particle right. the, the immortality all of that stuff i mean is is this part of like is it in the yeah. bible is it something you've uh, researched no but it, it's i mean you get the information about the mark of the beast right and what it right, does right right so then you start yeah. to match that up so like quantum mechanics is something that if you read into it and research on the whole pioneering of that comes from scientists who said that you have to be conversant with the Upanishads and the Vedas to understand that because it gives you the concept and the guidance and you need quantum computing to be able to get into other universes. AI, so it goes deep. Yeah. So, yeah. So, a, yeah. yeah. It, it would take a long I, I time deep, to kind of describe. Yeah. It. I go deep on, on the research in terms of how I arrive at some of those connections gotcha. and the, the Davos, information comes from the communiques they put out every year gotcha gotcha um and uh tracy it says uh member for nine months at level two support thank you very much tracy thank you for coming back and another fantastic conversation gary i enjoyed listening and learning tonight very much appreciate it thank you dino as always uh thank you tracy for the comment and the uh, support for as long as you have and uh, drune backed up really quick uh that question he had he said in the old testament in exodus leviticus numbers and deuteronomy it seems that god was physically here on earth during that time i think that's what he was referring to oh okay well that would be um 
when you when you go back to Hebrew in terms and and, and again our translations don't communicate all the meanings properly. You have um, Elohim, which shows up in Genesis one, and then in Genesis two you get Lord uh, uh, Lord God, which is Yahweh Elohim. In the Bible, uh, Yahweh is un, would be understood as the Word of God. And then when you start to see the angel of the Lord and in the burning bush and that I am and the words that that's formed um, uh, out of Hebrew is the format for Yahweh. And so you have to go through that sort of etymologically to sort of get there. So the word became flesh. Yahweh did. Uh, as opposed to Elohim, the superlative nature of the three uh, spirit, uh, the word and God. And the word is the one who created all things at the command of God. He's Because when God speaks, that's the word. He becomes flesh. And then he was crucified and went back and sits at the right hand side of God. So he still, mm-hmm. the you know, that component is still there. It's just that there's a distinction between God and, and Yahweh or God and the word. Just as there's a distinction between the spirit. They're on the same page. They're the reflection of each other, mm-hmm. yeah. but uh, and it and that's a it's a complicated concept so much so that it split the Roman Church into the Eastern Orthodox Church over the argument on it, and then mm-hmm. about the year one thousand A.D. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And John David. Oh my God. You bring up a uh, another topic that can be a whole show. Like he's he's talk he's asking about CERN, something to do. Uh, well, yeah, you, and I, <laughs> I mean, and I was going to say if we connected CERN into that uh, mark of the beast, and yeah. when we talked, because I mentioned two gods, yeah, yeah. CERN and Cernunos before, <laughs> yes, right, our nature right. gods, which is the pan god, and that they are also destroyer gods, just as Azazel is the is the is the destroyer god, Abaddon, Apollyon, and Shiva, which is the one that is sort of. Um, popularized alongside with with the CERN uh, plant, it all starts to say, hey, wait, there, there's a way too many coincidences here. So CERN is not an acronym. It mm-hmm. is actually named after the Etruscan god uh, that would be an equivalent to Azazel. Yeah, this, yes, a very interesting uh, topic. And yeah, what they're trying to do over there again we would that would be another whole show i mean <laughs> so yeah there, there's there's a lot yeah. going on on this planet that yeah i've, I've done whole know. shows on lots of these topics i mean there's there just so go. much information on it so yeah. yeah yeah so so anyways yes it's 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 about 9 30 um well it is 9 30 i think uh and we've done an hour and a half with gary again and it just flew by um uh, great show thanks for he, he you you said hey let's talk about halloween i said thank you that sounds like a good idea i had other plans of uh, other things to talk about but that made for a great starting point so thank sure. you gary um i appreciate that um can we have gary back to talk about the new world order the one world government and other really mm-hmm. deep topics listen when I, gary i'm sure will come back again if he wants to um, if i'm invited of course you will be we'll <laughs> give it we'll give it a, a couple months or something yep. we'll wait yep. uh, again he's got another book working on in the process and it will be coming out eventually so listen we, we will have him back on again and then he, he's got the other book but don't forget the book that he has right now the genesis 6 conspiracy if you haven't checked it out the link is in the description tracy's dropped it many times in the the chat so uh listen if you enjoyed the show get the book it's on amazon and um it's a good read uh one which i haven't gotten all the way through yet but i'm slowly working my way through (laughs) um but yes gary thank you very much for uh joining the show tonight again uh i really do enjoy having you on when i do and i appreciate it well thank you it's uh it's been a lot of fun and uh Again, we're just trying to connect some doc- dots for people and uh, hopefully have people dig a little bit deeper and yep. make some good decisions out there as to what they actually uh, what they actually believe and not what they assume. 
that, that, well said and we'll end it right there because that was a perfect ending so um gary thank you again i will be in contact and um yeah you take care i'm gonna end the show now and you take care bud okay terrific you too thank you gary okay there you go you guys uh <laughs> gary wayne uh, many of you have asked for it, and there he was. And I love that we touched on Halloween right before Halloween. Um, yeah, and everybody's saying thank you uh, here. Um, I can put all your guys' things up the uh, chat up there. Yeah, you, you guys are great. Uh, thank you guys all very much. Um, Overnight tonight, we have, let's see, we have a crime and mystery compilation. So you guys will enjoy that uh, all night long. And um, I will be putting a um, show together tomorrow night that will contain all the timestamps and all that good stuff. So uh, look forward to that. Uh, Rich Cat Ranch, the uh, overnight stream link is right there. Thank you very much. And, um, yes, make sure you hit all the descriptions, uh, give the channel a join, uh, Patreon. If you uh, want to support the channel and everything we do, we got a lot of good guests coming up here really, really soon. And with that said, you know, I'm going to get ready for the overnight stream and much love to each and every one of you guys. And